welcome everybody for coming in and uh, first of all I'd like to thank um, Chief Brad McConnell for doing a tour of the police station with myself and Deputy Mayor Yankov and uh, Councillor Ramsey on the 16th and it was a well-informed couple of hours so thank you very much uh, any declarations of conflict of interest? See none. Thank you. And any mover for um, approval of the agenda? And Ramsey, Nankoff, second. Thank you. And minutes, adoption of the minutes attached from last meeting. Sure. Councilman Ramsey. Second. Thank you. Any business arising from the minutes? Okay, move on to reports. We'll start with fire. Mr. Mamie, Chief Mamie. Thank you, Chair, Your Worship. Uh, the operational report, uh, which is uh, in package, uh, rather concise and short this uh, time around as we're starting the new year. So January 1st to January 16th, uh, fire inspections, we had nine, uh, two with compliance orders, uh, three plan reviews, and four fire investigations. Uh, total number of calls were 49, 32 for station one, 13 for station two, and four inspector call-outs. Uh, department training, which had just resumed again in January from their uh, Christmas break. Um, District 1 conducted a tour of the Confederation Center, which is uh, quite the building if you haven't been through entirely uh, to get down in the bottom and, and really get around. So uh, that's something we try to do on an annual basis just for those buildings that are uh, rather large and uh, uh, cut up as, through the years. So we always make sure we're getting in there for a tour. Uh, incident command, accountability, and rapid intervention training also took place uh, with District 2 and at District 1. Uh, department activities, we resumed again putting together the uh, schedule for the preschool and school visits for fire prevention and safety lessons. Uh, work continued on the city strategic plan, the governance review, the official plan and the department's operational plan along with the capital and operational budget preparations and we'll talk about draft capital uh, a little later. We've also welcomed one new member, volunteer firefighter Sarah Jane Bell as of the 3rd of January. Uh, Sarah Jane came to us from Belfast Fire and she has over 12 years firefighting experience. And we also have four new recruits who have started out their uh, level one training out at the Prince Edward Island uh, Firefighting Association School. And that began on January 4th, I believe it was. Uh, that concludes the operational report, uh, report Chair. Uh, open to any questions. Thank you, Chief. Our police, uh, Chief McConnell. Thank you, Chair. Um, our police service uh, answered uh, 1,048 calls for service uh, this month to date in January. Our uh, teams are fully engaged in the planning of a couple of significant events, including the Canada Games uh, planning and security, security measures. Our street crime unit also uh, had two large drug seizures um, over the past month, and uh, uh, they're doing great work in that area. Um, and that, uh, that includes my operational, uh, report, uh, chair, um, and, uh, I can move on from there. Um, just, I guess a question with Canada Games, is there many of your officers kind of set aside just for Canada Games or how is that set up? Yeah, so our, our operational plan will have a number of duties, and we will have a, a team and a, um, a satellite office on site to support the, uh, support the games. So we're looking forward to be, being a part of that and uh, certainly um, ensuring that there's a, uh, a safe, uh, safe environment for everyone. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Yeah, I have a question for Council. the chief. Chief, uh, Houston Street by Ken's Corner, I still call it Ken's Corner anyway. Uh, when you're coming down Longworth Avenue, I was been asked by a few residents before, when you're turning right on Houston, they used to yield and then go through. Is that still the way the plan is since we set up the new lights? Or would you know about that? 
Um, I can have that reviewed with our public works. Public uh, public works department uh, normally looks after the lights and the timings and uh, the makeups of the intersections. But uh, just so I, I'm not answering incorrectly, I just a little time to review that, and uh, I'll get back to uh, committee on that. And I can email uh, the chair and you on that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, because one resident or one person alone stopped me a couple weeks ago, and they said <clears throat> when you're turning right on Houston, they just we always used to just yield, right? And then they don't know if they're supposed to still yield with the new lights and all that, or begin, and then people are blowing the horn behind them and all that. So I'm just wondering, I, I just told him I'd ask the question as he was going. Thank you. Yes, and uh, I just want to double check on the signage down there to make sure it's appropriate. If there isn't a yield sign, then that would apply, but if there's no signage at all, then it's a kind of emerging. But I just want to double check on that and I'll get back to you. Here I can move on to personnel. personnel. Sure. Yeah. So uh, happy to announce that four of our members will be receiving the the Queen's uh, Jubilee Medal, um, and uh, so Corporal Tara Watts uh, for her work with the Crime Stoppers organization, Constable Zach Gould, who uh, has uh, been instrumental in our in our mental health response to the community and work with the, the Aboriginal groups. Uh, Constable Rob Schnarr for his longtime military service and continuous service in policing, and Acting Corporal Tim Kaiser with his, for his community-based uh, policing initiatives. So congratulations to them. Uh, our, we also have um, some training underway. We have uh, three um, people over in Amherst today uh, taking uh, critical incident command uh, training. So that is ongoing, and that's my personnel report. Okay, thank you. Move on to bylaws. Uh, so a couple, uh, couple of things discussed within the the bylaws. So as you're as you're aware, and probably all aware, that uh, the taxi industry has uh, has uh, had struggling adapting to the increased uh, cost of living and and cost of things like gas and and um, have uh, certainly asked us to look at the rates. Uh, so we've been working with uh, stakeholders in the industry and we met on the 17th of January to discuss those issues and other issues about the sustainability of taxis. Our, our bylaw officer did a, a jurisdictional stand for, for models across the region and um, we looked at uh, one out of Fredericton, which uh, might have some merit here in Charlottetown, but we're still gathering that information, where there is a, uh, um, an onus on taxi stands to uh, owners to be part of an association, and that association um, is responsible for setting the rates uh, up for taxi fares. And uh, as we compile that information and get it into uh, um, uh, we'll put it in a briefing note to submit to committee, but we're still in the still in the consulting and gathering stage of that. Any okay. questions? Thank you, uh, 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 Mr. Chair. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, previously, you were not allowed to drive a taxi in Charlottetown unless you were licensed by city police. Um, is that still the, the case? Yes, absolutely. So it's a several step process. So you have a stand uh, has to apply for a license. And once a stand is granted, they can uh, essentially adopt drivers. So you can't apply for a taxi driver's license unless you're associated to a stand. Okay. And uh, so one is connected to the other. Um, yeah, Thanks. take it. Um, with that, uh, Chief, sorry, um, license, the new app for Toro, I think it's called, where people can rent out cars or taxi them, is that a part of the, anything like that fall under the bylaw? It doesn't, it doesn't fall under the bylaw or it's not applicable to the bylaw. So to be a, a taxi, you have to, there's certain things that, 
there's certain things that uh, um, are benefits to be having a taxi license and the ability that you can stand and wait for fares. You can advertise your, your taxi um, brand, um, and uh, but that's only within the confines of the city. We can only regulate that within our city. Some of these initiatives, like Toro, are province-wide, mm -hmm. uh, where they're called for service as opposed to standing and waiting. And uh, so there's no branded um, brand associated to it other than uh, someone in their personal vehicle. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair. So, Mr. Chair, if I look under the taxi bylaw, is section, part four, section 11, zones, it outlines the um, fees for taxis in zone one to six. And I know that in the past, any increase in those fares had to come back to this committee and then go, go to council. But I believe some of the taxi operators had been raising the, fare, the fares or the, the cost without coming to this elected body. And talking to some of the taxi operators and, and users, i.e. the Charlottetown Airport Authority, there's a lot of uh, issues with anyone trying to get a taxi, whether he or she's flying in from Halifax, Toronto, or I'm going downtown for a Friday night, going down at 7 o'clock in the evening. I can see at 4 o'clock in the morning, but 7 o'clock in the evening, we're, they're just not getting the taxi. So could you just tell me why are they arbitrarily raising their fares without coming to us, or is that something you addressed in... So to... if, the, if they are raising mm -hmm. the fares, they're doing it without the permission of committee and council, right? Um, and that's one of the challenges. We understand the, the concerns of the industry, and that's why we're looking at different models to allow them to be, uh, to, to be treated uh, fairly, I guess, in, in, in that situation. If the onus is on them to, and their association to regulate, if, they're empower, if, if council chooses to empower them to do that, then the onus will be on them to um, make it competitive uh, and equal across their their association, um, which which they do in in places like Fredericton. Um, the issue of sustainability of taxing is a much bigger issue, uh, and that's why we're in conversation with our partners like the airport and DCI, uh, because uh, policing uh, and uh, aspect of it, you know, is different than the economic development and the availability of taxes. We we can't solve those problems. We have to work with our partners. And that's why we're, we're trying to, instead of putting a Band-Aid on this um, situation, to put something before a committee and council that, that will uh, um, fix these issues going forward and, uh, and put more onus on the, uh, the tax industry to solve some of, the, some of the own issues. So, so, Mr. Chair, if I can just follow up. Um, Mr. Chair, I know taxi... The taxi bylaw falls under pol uh, emergency police protective services, emergency services standing committee. And I know it intersects with economic development because, you know, we need that service, like our transit, we need it there. So anyone that's here in Charlottetown where they live here, they're visiting here, that they can get from point A to point B, point B back to point A or wherever they're going. So, and the industry, you're... Chief, I've seen the industry change right from the beginning of the transit system back in 2005. It, it started to you know, change because residents, visitors were hopping on the bus and now we're over to a million users of the T3 since 2005 and that's gonna continue to grow. I'm just wondering if, Mr. Chair, we could look at sitting down with the owners, taxi owners, the taxi, drivers, professionals, operators, ourselves in economic development, just try to, to have a discussion about it. And, and I'm looking at a hybrid rather than just us doing it all or them doing it all. Let's look at a hybrid where we can work together and provide a better service for the citizens, residents, and visitors to Charlottetown. Is that something that we can look at, Mr. Chair or Mr. Chief, or Chief, Chief Brad McConnell? 
Um, absolutely, Your Worship and, and Chair. Um, I did chair a, uh, a, a task force on taxi and taxi safety, 2015-2016, uh, and uh, we overcome some some issues uh, like safety and and uh, and um, things like uh, electronic payment vehicles, and we did have some success. There were some shortfalls, and uh, but I think uh, if we can we can harness that group and get them talking. Uh, with us and in, and to each other, I think we'll all benefit from that. So we're happy to explore that. So, Mr. Chair, I, I think that can go through administration on how we try to organize it, mm -hmm. but it could include the airport authority, DCI, Charlottetown, uh, the Greater Charlottetown Chamber of Commerce, all our partners. So we're all sitting around the table, and I can say, Chief, that we met for what 18 months, 26 months, and this whole accessibility taxi issue. PEI Taxi Online have two uh, totally accessible taxis, and I think we honored them at one of our civic disabilities uh, get-togethers this past last year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's there, there are tools out there, there's services out there we can find out a lot more if we can come together and try to find a solution, especially with we're slowly getting out of post-COVID-19 and, you know, people are adapting and uh, pivoting. So tourism, I'm sure, will see a bump and the cruise ships will see a bump. So we need, we need taxis out there. We need transit out there. We need services out there that can provide something to move people from that point A to point B issue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, Continuing on on bylaws, uh, Chair. So um, we, uh, we are in the process of trying to find a path forward in blending our street vendors bylaw and our COVID-19 temporary patio bylaw. Um, Pre-COVID-19, um, we had 22 parking spaces um, set aside for patios. Um, with the onset of COVID and the outreach from the downtown business community and the, and the need to social distance and uh, provide outdoor spacing, um, the uh, COVID-19 patio bylaw was uh, implemented and additional 22 spaces were, uh, were added. So now as we move out of COVID, uh, we have to find a way forward on that. So I've, been, uh, I've asked our city solicitor to provide some language uh, on blending the two uh, to move forward so we can present to committee and council on, on uh, what the proper verbiage and language uh, should be um, to accommodate that. There's been significant investment uh, by, uh, by the people that uh, came onto the program through COVID-19 and uh, we've heard uh, certainly an appetite for them to want to continue and so we're, we're trying to find a way forward and, and make sure it's a responsible um, way forward. I can tell you um, prior to COVID-19 that this may not have been such an um, attractive um, situation for the city of Charlottetown, but the parking landscape has changed a bit in the downtown with, uh, with places like the Department of Veteran Affairs uh, not fully occupied and other places. So there is the ability to accommodate um, those and we recognize that so we certainly want to uh, um, make sure that uh, um, our recommendation to council is a responsible one and it's uh, it's forward thinking so uh, we'll provide that uh, as we, as uh, we move forward when it's available uh, mr. chair if I may chief uh, <clears throat> we have a cap right on outdoor patios I believe a few years ago and then we ex I think we're up to around 22, I think you said, or close to that anyway. Like, what's the cap? Is it is it 28 or th that we have room for? Or? So the street vendor bylaw, bylaw uh, accommodates 24 parking spaces for um, licensed ve uh, vendors. So 24, business, or 24 parking spaces for people to use that have um, liquor licenses associated to the buildings. Um, the COVID-19 patio uh, bylaw um, extended that to an additional 22 spaces uh, with uh, 
uh, less criteria, so that they, they could they could not have a, a liquor license to to uh, to um, put the patio out there. So, what we're attempting to do, or look looking to do, is find a, a way forward to blend the two, um, and uh, have a certain amount of um, licensed uh, spots and a certain amount of non-licensed spots to give availability and opportunity to different merchants. So I guess the answer uh, is 20, 24 before COVID, um, additional 22 with COVID, so a uh, uh, total of 46 spots. So those 46 spots are there as long as they pay their dues every year? Like we're, we're not cutting back, like as I said, we're at 22 or 24. <clears throat> So the ones that went in under COVID are going to stay there. Am I correct? Uh, certainly, that, that's the decision of council, but uh, that would be our recommendation at this point, and uh, um, we'll, um, we'll we will provide the information and the and the language that will uh, give the framework for it at a later date. But uh, that is our that is the plan. Thank you, Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Um, so, um, to the chair, and perhaps then through to um, Chief McConnell. So presently we have, I think we're maxed out with our 24 um, um, spots for our street vendors, which always had to be licensed, whereas our COVID-19, the, um, there was the option that they didn't have to be licensed through the province for serving alcohol. And I'm just wondering, um, how, and maybe we're just not there yet, but how, how you plan to combine that together and the other part of it is we've had a few um, concerns around accessibility and I just want to make sure too that as we're going down this um, discussion to create just the one bylaw to ensure that we um, apply that accessibility lens to all of those parking spots and parking areas that are going to be um, out of commission for that period of time. So two questions. One, the accessibility lens being applied to the new bylaw, and the second one is how you might envision we are addressing licensed during versus non-licensed um, patios. Thanks. Certainly, uh, parking accessibility is... Uh, the forefront of our mind and we'll work with our public works partners to to ensure that and uh, spaces that were were used uh, um, accessible spaces were used uh, um, for I think one installation of a COVID patio bylaw but there was an additional one added I believe uh, to compensate for that so um, there was no uh, there was no erosion of accessible parking spots but as as uh, as we move forward, certainly that's at that forefront of our mind. Um, we um, we know we know that these uh, there's three year uh, terms associated to the to the street vendors bylaw, and uh, why the COVID nineteen bylaw is year to year at this point. So we're looking to give the vendors some stability uh, by migrating them, um, and we'll uh, and we'll certainly uh, keep accessibility. Uh, in consideration for any new uh, applications, but it wouldn't be our recommendation to expand any more than than uh, what is already allotted. And just as a follow-up, Chair, since we've brought this up, is this the appropriate time to look at our food trucks as well that take some of our parking spots, or are we looking at that under a separate time? We can, yeah, go ahead, Chief. I guess um, the same question. Yeah, do they, when you get the food, what do you call it, the uh, street vendor bylaw for the patios, is the food trucks taking up the same parking spots that are set aside for the patios? Or is there separate ones, too? No, though, there, are there are separate ones for those, and, uh, and uh, I can get the details and report back to committee on that. Uh, okay. And uh, they can vary from year to year. Thank you. Mr. Chair. 
Mr. Mayor. Mr. Chair, I, again, Donna, our CEO, remembers back in <clears throat> 2004, 2005 when we opened our, I think St. James Gate was the first to open up with a patio out in front on Kent Street and there was, was a change and there was issues about it. But today and with COVID, these extensions of their businesses have offered a lot. Mm -hmm. And you know what? It makes our city more walkable. And I think it, uh, many, many residents, citizens are looking at making our city more walkable. So I think following up with the deputy, I, you know, how do you melange the 24 that we have and the 22 that were added under this temporary COVID-19 patio bylaw? Um, and as you said, Chief, a lot of money was invested. You can see some of these um, outdoor patios. They're well constructed, aesthetically pleasing for the downtown, respectful of the 500 lots criteria. So I don't know how we do it, but uh, I think we have to keep in, keep in mind that they, they work very well and the business owners are very appreciative of how we quickly adapted to accommodating, pivoting to make our businesses work hand in hand or work with through this COVID-19 pandemic. So I think, you know, we have to walk slowly on this issue, but uh, the accessibility is, is, is top of mind because of uh, an issue or situation that took place in Queen and, and uh, on Queen Street. So I think going forward, um, is it, Back to 24, I don't think so. Is it 46 and above? Um, anywhere in between 24 and 46 would be fine for me. Thank you. Anything else on bylaws, Chief? Um, sorry, Chair. Um, you also should have in your package uh, a briefing note, uh, Jill, did you? Yeah, it's the last page of the package. Um, regarding the request for proposals that was put out for towing services uh, last year. And uh, in this briefing note, uh, we recommend as a result of the RFP that Shaw's towing uh, be granted uh, a two-year um, rate uh, for towing services for the police service. I'm in favor, Chair, because you can just tell seven, 70 out of 100 and then 9 out of 100 and 90 out of 100. So, Charles looks like she, they got her good. Thank you. Yeah. Do, do we need a seconder for that or anything, or is that it's just in favor? Just a vote? Okay. I can second that, Chair. Guys, tell me. Do we need a vote? Okay. Um, we'll go for a vote for that. Just raise your hands. All in favor of taking Shaw's? Two? Yeah. All opposed? One? Passed. Thank you, Chair. Um, moving on to uh, community policing. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Mr. Chair, um, yeah. that will now go to council. Okay. Be, uh, as a resolution that council will come from this committee to council. Just, I, I know this is your first time okay. rolling through yeah. this, so um, okay. I just want to make sure you were aware of that. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Our community, police, our community uh, policing uh, um, section has been busy, uh, certainly with Canada Games and a number of festival festivals, including the Illumination Festival and the Torch Run associated to Canada Games, um, but also in support of uh, uh, Park Street location and the encampment uh, with our mental wellness unit. Um, we had... Uh, 30, um, 
39 calls for service uh, associated to Park Street since um, since the 9th of September, since it opened. Um, and uh, our staff continues to, to work, uh, community policing staff continue to work with uh, with um, staff allocation to lessen the impact in those neighborhoods and, and areas around there. Um, also this morning, we were in contact with the uh, Department of uh, Social House, Housing and Development regarding uh, um, their issuing issuance of a trespass notice at the encampment site. And it's our understanding that they were planning to um, act upon that uh, today, uh, as information this morning. So our community policing section uh, will support them. Now I know that they were logistically trying to find some support uh, from contractors associated to that. So that may have changed, but as of this morning, that was the plan. So. And um, that's my community policing update, Chair. Thank you. Uh, off to draft capital budget. Discussion? Draft capital budget discussion. Um, in your package, you should have a copy of our um, capital budget uh, requirements for 2023 and 24 and some carryovers, some requested carryovers from last year. And uh, I want to take a moment to review that and I can answer any questions that you might, that you might have. in the package? Yeah, it's the last page. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Chief, you were at... Uh Cameras installed times seven. And those are new ones that you were discussing with us last week in our tour? The iWatch? E-Watch. Or E-Watch, sorry. Yeah, so um, that would be uh, monies to uh, complement our E-Watch program and installations in, uh, in certain areas of the city where we do not have coverage uh, uh, now. Um, we've, uh, we as a um, corporation and a... Uh, Police service and as a community have invested uh, largely in our e-watch program and has paid significant dividends, and uh, would like to continue on that path with the with seven uh, with seven more cameras. And are the businesses involved with the new purchase of the seven more? If there's any around that area, I guess. So we'll continue to uh, um, work with uh, new partners. So. Um, to that want to sponsor cameras in the area of the business. This is separate inside. This is um, so. Although we're asking for for monies for seven, we may have other additional partners join in that will complement that. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up on that, um, in last year's budget, Mr. Chair, there was no line item for cameras, e-cameras, but the year before 21-22, there were line item, a line item for 49,000. Yeah. So do you look at it, doing it every two years? It all depends, uh, Your Worship, on uh, the maintenance schedule and the, like, um, there's, a, <coughs> there's a certain amount of replacement uh, and areas of the city we want coverage, coverage in to, to augment. Now last year, our, uh, we felt that you know we had enough and uh, uh, to <coughs> occupy the resources available to do those upgrades and implementation. So this year we feel that uh, there's going to be available resources and uh, to uh, implement seven, at least seven new. So um, we're um, yeah. So I, I 
I'm not saying every two years. Um, it, all the, it, it's it it's based on a number of factors. So, so Mr. Chair, just to follow up. Um, some of the other communities around Prince Edward Island are looking at the cameras. I think they're working with our Charlottetown Police Services. And um, just want to find out these e cameras are not part of this capital budget. That would be under their own municipality budget, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So, Summerside and Kensington have joined our e watch LPR program with funds uh, granted through the Federal Guns and Gangs Initiative. Um, we're very proud to say that. Uh, Places like Fredericton, New Brunswick, and New Glasgow, Nova Scotia have adopted uh, our vision and uh, program of, of e-watch and, uh, and uh, implementing their own programs, of course, with their, uh, you know, um, kind of relying on us for, for uh, support in, in how we evolved it, and, uh, and we're happy to provide, uh, to provide that. But any monies or hardware associated to their initiatives is solely on them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chief Brad McConnell. All right. Thank uh, you, Chief. Is that all for? Yeah. So, yep. Chair. So our total uh, new budget ask would be one hundred ninety-five thousand eight hundred, um, with sixty-eight thousand one seventy-six to carry over for a total of six hundred two two hundred sixty-three nine seventy-nine uh, for this year. Um, Okay. Um, Chief, there's something I'm not 100%. There was something in the paper about vehicles. You're upgrading from your current style to SUVs. Is that? So, yeah, so our small fleet will fall under public works for procurement. Okay. Under a different, okay. Thank you. That concludes my report, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Any new business? Sorry. You kind of skipped over. No. Responsible. I was in the cab the other day. We were going over to play and I need us. And uh, I'm going to back up here, um, Chief Mamie. Are you? Yeah. I see. Brought to my attention, I skipped a couple of your things. Thank you. Chief Mamie, I'll give, hand it over to you. Thank you, Chair. Worship. Um, I just handed out copies. I apologize for not uh, providing these in time to Jill to get in the package, but uh, uh, we can have a look through them. Uh, there should be like, two copies there. You'll have the fire uh, capital budget. These are both drafts, of course, and the emergency measures preparation budget. EMO, basically, uh, I manage both of those, so uh, these are both the capital budgets for that. Um, if we look at uh, the carryovers from 2022-23 uh, budget, uh, the fire station design, that number is going to change when we finalize things because the design is complete and all of the bills have been paid. So that number as a carryover is going to reduce uh, substantially as it should be completed. Uh, the foam trailer that was, that was uh, in the op or capital budget for 212000 in 2022-23 We've reassessed and uh, basically uh, 
eliminated that from the future budget. Uh, there may be a time it comes back. Turnout gear, that's going to be on an annual. Uh, what our hope is there is uh, turnout gear is on a 10-year um, use uh, program. So after 10 years, it's got to be taken out of service, and, and so we rotate. And we have uh, approximately 200-plus sets of gear. So I'm trying to get on a 10-year program where we can get 20 sets on an annual basis. We'll have our normal amount of surplus, and then when we come out of stock, we'll always be, uh, we'll always be healthy for that. So you'll see that in there uh, on an annual basis. Uh, small equipment. There was a change to the amount from uh, 4 22 23 uh, Some of the money from the phone trailer went there so we could complete purchases. Uh, that came down to availability of... Uh, equipment, uh, resources, apparatus, whatever we were looking for, so we had to adjust our, uh, our purchasing process. And you'll see that going forward, there's an addition to it, so we're looking for 120 there for small equipment in 22, or 23, 24. Uh, fast rescue craft carryover plus the increase uh, due to uh, cost increase, you'll see 400,000. Our engine two replacement, we have two vehicles up for replacement, both are similar in uh, make and model, so uh, 1.2, we'll get uh, one of the engines. The problem with our apparatus ordering these days is that uh, depending on make and model, they're up to 48 months out for delivery these days. Um, that's from one of the main providers, Pierce. So uh, when we go to tender, uh, it'll be determined at that point when we'll actually get delivery, but it won't be a uh, order and receive in the same year. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, may I have a question? Yes. Uh, for the chief. Yes, Fast response craft. Yes. That's the boat? Yes, it is, yeah. Council. I thought we uh, sort of put that in the back burners for the last four or five years because we're supposed to find out from the former chief and <clears throat> that it was it's federal waters and the whole nine yards, and <clears throat> and they're supposed to look into it to see if they're, like Ottawa, would sort of help us out financially on that thing if, if we're going to go with it. And, uh, and I just see it here again, like it's been here every year, but I thought we put it in the back burner. I know we just, uh, Councillor, uh, we just uh, paused that last year. It was brought forward and uh, inspect uh, by uh, former chief, uh, Randy McDonald. Um, what's going on with it here now? I'm doing some uh, investigating into port security money that's available federally and a couple of other sources. So that may change in, in 23, 24 as to the amount we require from capital. Hopefully it will be less when we get some uh, partner funding. But we are continuing uh, looking forward in that. And it is... The jurisdiction is, uh, hasn't changed, but we still are able to provide that uh, security and fire protection and rescue ability uh, on quick notice. So we continue working forward with that, and the boat is, uh, has done its service for us. It's, uh, we've, it's, we don't, it doesn't owe us anything at the end of the day. Uh, quick typo at the bottom, that should say replace hydraulic rescue equipment. That is all the equipment associated with, uh, as common terminology for everybody here, the jaws of life and all the equipment that goes with that. So those, uh, those uh, resources, those pieces of equipment are carried on our first and second line vehicles. So the first engine out the door has, an, has a, um, a good supply of that equipment on board to address any emergency when they receive, and also the rescue apparatus at both stations is fully equipped. So to replace all of our existing gear with hydraulic gear is quite pricey. Uh, you see 385,000 plus. Um, we may be able to work that down, and that's the hope in, in the numbers of equipment, but that's a full replacement. And some of our equipment that we are using that's currently uh, operated hydraulically instead of battery operated, which is all this new equipment is battery operated, uh, better for obviously for the uh, environment. <clears throat> we don't have to run our gas uh, little hydraulic engines. Uh, we don't have to run hydraulic fluid through them. So that's an elimination of uh, a couple of sources that we're dealing with, and some of those are entering their fourth decade of service, so uh, they're well due for replacement. Um, and I can further explain that on, on any, uh, any questions from the uh, committee here. And finally, the uh, recreation of the uh, equipment airlifting bags. One again, once again, uh, vital equipment to rescue and haven't been replaced in, uh, in several decades, so they are due. Uh, they do pass inspection. They are serviceable. I don't mean to state that, but uh, we're looking to replace that and upgrade them and bring them into, uh, into line with today's modern equipment. Uh, those are the two uh, heavy and newest items, but that does complete the capital budget for fire. And once again, this is just draft and still working with finance on the final numbers. I'll be happy to answer any questions on fire, or we can jump right to the emergency preparedness. Just have one question, Chief. Back to the FRT. I know it's federal waters, 
Do Coast Guard have somebody stationed here for a fast response in the summer? Uh, there is a, uh, a chair. There is a uh, more of a more of a student program they put on through the summer. So there's certain hours through the run of the day that they are, but they're not there 24/7. Um, any call in inshore, uh, in harbor, or anywhere out in, in the waters in the vicinity uh, vicinity of Charlottetown, we get that first call. Mm -hmm. uh, most municipalities, uh, fire departments, uh, the 36 of them, uh, anywhere near water, they do have one. And it's a, an important resource in that first response before the province and feds can kick in with all of their resources. And that's the way it is supposed to work. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, with the uh, EMO budget, uh, rather straightforward. We didn't get the, uh, the emergency shelter supplies that were scheduled for 2022-23, uh, for so we're looking to carry that over, 19,000. Uh, the generators, I'm working with our asset uh, management, our asset manager, uh, to work on those numbers, have been ordered, tendered, or tendered, ordered, and some supplies have arrived, so I have to work with our asset manager to uh, get those numbers finalized. And the one addition is uh, PIX2, uh, radios, those are the uh, radios used provincially. Uh, police use them as well with an encryption, but uh, we found during Fiona, uh, we were definitely uh, lacking in some of those resources to be able to communicate out in the field and back in the uh, in our headquarters here as well. So we're looking to pick up some radios and that's an expense of around 60,000 there to, uh, to put in place and be able to use them during uh, those emergencies when we actually need them. Several layers of communication that we're trying to work through. So that's one that can give us direct access to all of our partners out there, mutual aid assistance with fire departments, EMS, police, um, and central dispatch, and all the way through. So, uh, Mr. Again, Chair, right. Mr. Chair, yes. Or do we already have generators at Station One, Two, in the police station? Uh, we don't currently have one at Station Two. That's a brand new generator out there. We've been using portables and trying to get by with that. Uh, Station One and City Hall have generators, but they need upgrades. Uh, we discovered that once again during Fiona when, with the long outage. Uh, with the minimum amount of uh, appliances and lights that can be worked uh, with the generators currently in place is not suffice to, uh, to get through a, a lengthy duration. And the police station currently has one, but needs upgrade as well, correct? Yeah, that's, that's correct, uh, Chair. So. I think there was money allocated in last year's capital budget for the replacement of the police uh, generate the police station generator it hasn't happened yet but uh, i think it's in the works so just to follow up if you don't mind mr chair um the ones that are already there are, are these going to be new ones or these or this cash allotted just for upgrades on these ones that are there the uh, uh Councillor uh, Ramsey, the money that was in there from 22, 23 are for replacements, brand new generators. So is there any way with our city corporation that we can use the older ones somewhere? Uh, the two that are, are taken out of City Hall would not be of use just because of their age. Uh, I would assume the same with the uh, police department, so I don't think we can get much of a return on that. And I'm not sure if that was assessed during the tendering process or if it was a part of that. Once again, that was handled by asset manager. But uh, I will follow up there and see where we're at. Okay, thank you. Just that to follow up. the uh, draft budget review. Mr. Yeah. Chair, just to follow up in oh, there, Councilor Ramsey? Yep. Um, so Chief Brad McConnell said it's not in his budget for a uh, backup generator to replace the one that's over there. That's going to be considered. Um, it's out of this one. It's, yeah, it's going to be out of this one? Yeah. Yes, you worship. So the 80 kilowatt station one, 80 kilowatt station two, 125 kilowatt generator. So why would that fa fall under emergency pre preparedness and not as a capital item for police? Your Worship, uh, why it's under the capital for EMO, um, I think in, just in relation to who manages those and actually maintains them. It's not the, uh, the users in the, in the uh, occupancies, it is, it is actually an uh, emergency measure. So the asset manager along with fire, we do the uh, weekly runs up, run ups on them and make sure that they're serviceable. So it's an emergency preparedness capital item. Okay, so for the utility, they have backup generators. They don't fall under emergency preparedness, they fall under their own corporation? That's correct, Your Worship. Okay. Um, I know you have your report here that you're going to be talking about Fiona, and I know during this 
hurricane, po post-tropical storm that uh, we had a lot of issues. And the three-day shutdown is probably going to six days or nine days because many residents here in Charlottetown were without power for nine days, 14 days, 13 days out of Donna's place. CAO's house, you, if you went out into rural PEI, it was longer than that. And I know there are facilities that the city owns, so we do own the East, we are majority shareholder in the East Link Center. I think they need a backup gener generator uh, because if the storm, Hurricane Fiona, came from the south and caused a lot of flooding from the south and into the downtown core, we would have had to move people to emergency, an emergency uh, zone or emergency facility. And the East Link Center, I don't think, would have been prepared for it because the generator wasn't working. I think their ice melted. If you go out to the Cary facility, the Bell Alliance Center, we just had the stakeholders meeting last week, and they do not have a backup generator for the concourse area. So these are facilities that we are the major majority shareholders on the board. So I think we have, and, and if we want to put them under EMO, probably we should be looking at those other facilities because going down the road, um, we got away this time. Maybe the next hurricane will be from the south, from and 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 tidal surge would not be from the North Shore and could be much more disastrous. I'm looking at down the road, we need facilities that will be accommodating, not just for 100 people, it could be 1,000 people. It could be more than that. And that's why we have the East Link Center. And we do have our partner uh, with the East Link Center, the provincial government uh, of Prince Edward Island, because they, op uh, they, they own and operate or maintain the East East Link Trade Center, so that could be a facility also that could provide accommodations for uh, disasters, a disaster like Hurricane Fiona. So I'm just asking Chief, if, Chief Tim, maybe if you can reach out through our asset manager, I think Paul Johnston, to look at other other uh, facilities that we have the majority uh, majority shareholder interests, i.e., East Link Center. Bell Alliance Center, that's just two of them, um, so that we can be prepared for any future, uh, future uh, natural disasters. And I think it should fall under, you're right, under emergency preparedness. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. If I could uh, respond to your worship and, and Chair. Um, the excellent uh, points, and those are all assessments that were made and uh, have been confirmed through our emergency preparedness, uh, emergency operations binder. We also have uh, memorandums of understanding with all of these uh, facilities. If we did have a flood that took out a certain zone or a, a weather event that took out a certain zone in the city, that is exactly right. We do have alternates for many of our locations. We have alternates for our emergency operations center, and we will look at residents uh, and a safe uh, landing spot for those. All of the schools have been assessed. All of the uh, large occupancies that could have any sort of uh, uh, stay over or emergency uh, shelter, we've assessed and have uh, memorandums of understanding with them all in regards to our emergency preparedness. Mr. Chair, if I can just follow up. Chief Tim, Amy, I, underst I understand that we have all these ancillary or additional plans, but from my discussions with our East Link partners and Bell Alliant, um, they require these backup generators, and I just believe this is a good time to put them on, on uh, put them on the order list. I'm sure there'll be other municipalities that will be looking through the same lenses as we are that we want to be prepared. Which I think you know the the, the EMO municipal team that was in place under your direction and Chief Brad McConnell, it was carried out 150 percent with efficiency and very effectively. Uh, uh, um, administered by the EMO municipal team. But going forward, I just want to make sure that we have those bases covered. This is budget time. This would be the time to look at it by reaching it. And, and the asset manager, Paul Johnston, could, could do that work. Thank you. Thank you, Worship. I'll definitely follow up with asset and with our stakeholders. 
Thank you, Chief. Um, update on the new fire station for the Northwest End. Thank you, Chair. Uh, once again, I apologize for not having this report in in time for the uh, agenda. Thank you. So, uh, Chair, the operational report, uh, or the uh, report in regards to uh, the uh, new station. Uh, this is a recommendation, once again, that the new fire station project remain paused before construction tendering. That's the uh, state we were in before the, uh, the new year, and uh, we're looking to maintain that. Um, we requested that as a result of the leadership team, myself and the district chiefs and deputy district chiefs for uh, both districts in discussion that the new station process remain paused so we could address several concerns that I detail below for the update and request an updated uh, fire underwriter survey, uh, FUS, you'll see that in other reports, and station location recommendation. Um, a fire underwriter survey conducted by the regional authority, which is uh, OPTA Information Intelligence, or formerly the uh, Canadian Underwriters Association. So they conduct fire underwriter surveys on behalf of the insurance uh, industry uh, and they provide ratings for each municipality throughout uh, Canada. Uh, that's what the fire underwriter survey is. And they come in and they look at your fire resources, your fire personnel, your water supply system, number of hydrants, uh, provision of water, um, communications, and a number of other items. Uh, it's quite an intensive review. Um, a quick or short review of the uh, previous history. There was a fire underwriter survey done in 2006. As a result of that, they it was determined that a fire station location study needed to be completed. So that was done in 2007. Uh, there was recommendations at that time for either one or two station operations. Uh, that carried on through 2011 when it was reconfirmed. 2015-16, there was a confirmation of the 2006 report's recommendations. There were uh, 15 recommendations made back in 2006, and the department has been working on uh, uh, 11 of them and four of them remain uh, to be worked on uh, or developed further and we can discuss those further. In 2017, an RFP and resolution to purchase land for Station 2 replacement uh, was made uh, and that was where the land we currently possess out off of Malpec Road by the CAT dealership uh, came into play. That land was purchased as a replacement for Station 2 to remain a two-station operation, but that would have replaced it. Uh, in 2018, there was another report reconfirming the 2006 study, and in 19, there was a, res a resolution passed for three stations and the land adoption, which um, internally in the department uh, caused those operational issues that we're bringing forward here. Uh, in accordance with all the reports, the department meets or exceeds its requirements for apparatus, equipment, and volunteer firefighters. All of those things are uh, well in place, well maintained, and well uh, looked after in regards to replacement and ongoing retention with volunteer firefighters. Uh, we do have some potential ongoing labor uh, and financial and location implications, which are, I'm trying to summarize for you below. Uh, we do have a newly certified firefighter union. Uh, all of our uh, permanent firefighters have joined the International Association of Firefighters, uh, and they've uh, established their own local Charlottetown Professional Firefighters Association. Um, we are currently awaiting arbitration with that group, so we do not have our first collective agreement in place yet. We are still working through that, and there are many items that are going forward to arbitration, so we're, we're on the pause with that until we can uh, address further. Our operational planning regarding our response areas, which are the response zones, uh, the number of personnel and response personnel breakdown, the apparatus placement, and uh, whether or not we require more uh, for a three-station model is currently insufficient, so we haven't uh, put all that in place for a three-station model, which is not the recommendation from any of the reports nor from uh, the leadership group. The two current stations are in regards to the city uh, in rather poor geographical positions or locations. And the location for the third compounds the issue if we were to work with all three. Um, it, it would increase departmental expenditures and it would not improve operations. Following purchase of the land to replace station two, a change from, once again, the two-station contest to a three, did not have a thorough informed assessment of service needs completed 
or the full involvement of the department leadership team. So we had a couple of issues there. The need for a current fire underwriter survey report and station location recommendation is imperative. Um, everybody could have their opinions and recommendations, but these are the actual, uh, the group or the, uh, the association that puts that all together and makes the recommendation for the departments in regards to their commercial uh, emergency response coverage or commercial rates and residential rates. Uh, good stewardship of the taxpayers' contributions would allow for a pause to the project at the completion of the design phase, which we have done, and in accordance with the RFP, we're, uh, we're awaiting uh, construction. This pause would allow for a further in-depth review of the operational requirements in line with our city strategic plan, which is still under development, and a possible opportunity to redraw district lines, amend career and volunteer staffing uh, issues, restructure the uh, career scheduling or the permanent scheduling over at the station and improve response and operational goals. So that is a, a basic uh, summation. We, we put this report uh, with some additional wording uh, through and it was approved by committee and council uh, to pause it. And this is just really a recommend or a report that's uh, in your hands now to catch you all up and, and let you know exactly where we're at with everything that's, uh, that's outstanding with the new station or the new station location. I'm very happy to answer any questions, and I'm sure there are a few, and I'll do my best to, uh, to provide the uh, response. One, I guess I have several, but what the Chief Mamie, why is the union going to arbitration being a holdup? What, how does that affect us building a new fire station? Well, our new collective agreement, hopefully, is going to have in there the scheduling matter. Uh, also, our, our response, we, we have right now uh, district lines. District 1 and District 2 are separated by an imaginary line on a map. If District 2 were to respond into District 1 without a District 1 response, we would have a grievance right now because it's a union and a volunteer matter. Um, if District 1 were to respond into District 2, we have that same issue. So to put this station where it's located, which is about a, a kilometer from District 1's uh, district line, would be a... Uh, much like where station one is, it would be a loss of uh, actual coverage rates. Um, it, further on, uh, we'll talk about coverage rates. Uh, we look at five kilometer and eight kilometer zones, five kilometer response areas from a station for commercial residents or commercial occupancies, which are obviously commercial buildings and apartment buildings with more than four uh, units, and then eight kilometers for residential from that station location. Um, so if you were to put that station in place, with that five kilometer radius, one kilometer into it, there would be no response beyond there. So we would lose coverage of four kilometers basically, and not just the response capabilities to it, but the operational or in, and insurance matters that come along with that. So the collective agreement is gonna have uh, a lot of in information in there that'll help us move forward with our operations. And uh, that's what's sort of uh, holding up one aspect of the hold up for uh, the build. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Chair, can I just? Mr. Mayor? First paragraph on the second page, following the purchase of the land. So the purchase of land was done in 2017 to replace station two, and I'm sure there was a resolution to uh, address replacement of station two. A change from two station concept to a three station concept did not have a thorough informed assessment of service needs completed within full involvement of the department leadership team. So, Chief Mamie, in election 2010, it was an issue. In election 2014, it was an issue. In election 2018, it was an issue to build a new station. So when I arrived here in City Hall after the election of 2018, I believe our deputy was, Deputy Mayor Yankoff was the chair of strategic priorities. We started right away on this effort to get this third station or a new fire services facility in the Winslow area. And I think we went through the process two years, two and a half years plus. I believe then Councillor Ramsey took over as chair of strategic priorities. Council Rivard took over as chair of police, uh, protective services, protective, serv uh, protective and emergency services standing committee. And then this, just this past year, we were told we have to press the pause button. 
all through that two and a half years, we were never told that this was not the right place. Never. And the reason I say that because we had some issues, remember? We recall Councillor Ramsey, Deputy Mayor Yankov, on the tendering issue for the design. We went with one, then we withdrew, and then, and again, that ended up in court. So, Chief, I, I know that, you know, you're doing your due diligence, your, 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 your lens, what you look through is much different than I do because you see fire services in, in from, from your pro professional perspective. But honestly, I know, and I sat at those meetings. We did, and Deputy Mayor Yankoff recalls, we did a tour of the Stratford facility, Stratford Crossroads uh, Fire Services facility, and I think it was 12,000 square feet because originally we were told we need 30,000 square feet. So we got it down, we actually took that concept of the big all service uh, fire service facility down to a satellite because that's what was discussed in 210, 214, 218 was a satellite. So I know we had to press the pause button, but I can tell you we didn't know until the 11th hour this and Deputy Mayor Yankup, I believe you were there also, Councillor Ramsey. We were told by you at the 11th hour, we have to press the pause button. So what I was working on, what we were working on as a council, we didn't know what, was, what, 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 what you've st stated here in this first paragraph and the second page, what was, that this was, you know, uh, not the plan that you were envisioning, envision, but we had a plan that we were envisioning that was to build a new station, especially out in the North End, because look at the development that's going on. The chair represents Ward 8. Uh, the chair of finance represents Ward 7, which is the North End of the city, North and Northwest End of the city. So I just want to put that on record. And again, it's no blame on you. I know you were, as you said, you were following the chain, chain of command. We were told that when we had to press the pause button. But I can tell you, there was a lot of work that was put into this right from the start uh, when, when we were elected as, as, as council and mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Chair, I just appreciate a moment and, uh, and uh, just a comment on a couple of things, Your Worship. But, uh, uh, I was only able to bring this forward uh, as you know when I was able to carry the file forward. Um, the biggest twist and the biggest hold up to this whole situation was that the land was purchased for a replacement of Station 2. If we had, and you'll see at one point, uh, if we had one station out at the new location and Station 1 still in place, the coverage areas would be uh, good and it would actually meet some of the recommendations through all of these reports from 2006 all the way up to current day, as, as Your Worship mentions. But there's no report that recommends a third station in that location for an operations of our, our department. There's no reports that recommend that. And because uh, basically what we're doing when we look at that, we average, this year is a bump, we had over 1,000 calls. We average 750, 800 calls a year. Uh, 550, to close to 600 of them are in District 1. 250 or so in District 2. If we were to split, which the plan became when it became a three station uh, uh, concept, we'd be splitting the 250 calls in half and leaving the 550 alone. So we're not improving operations by doing that. We have no intention of doing that. We don't want to purchase more vehicles to fill a station, nor do we want to staff it. So we have to look at those considerations. When the change was made, and how it was made, I can't speak to, but when we went from two to three, it caused the issues on that side of the, the situation, and that's why the pause was recommended part and parcel with the labor management issues. Hope yeah, Mr. Chair, pause. and I was on, on those committees. In fact, I was one of the ones that purchased that land, but when we, when their stories came out that it was going to replace Station 2, that's where everything hit the fan in here because of certain council members and everything like that. They didn't want to lose it, and the volunteer firefighters in that area did not want to lose it. And, uh, but it only makes common sense that we, like, do we need three? I, I, 
I'm not an expert on it, but at the same time, but that was the first plan to replace Station 2, and it didn't go over well in here with certain counselors, and that was the reason, the reason why we, put, we paused it at first, and then somebody pushed the envelope that said we're going to go with three, but three is a big number. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I could just, again, just follow up with the, what the chief said. Chief, like, in the 2017 resolution, it, it must have stated RFP and resolution to purchase of land for Station 2 replacement. Correct? That was in, in the resolution. Okay. So when we arrived here, Deputy Mayor Yankoff, myself, as a new councillor, as new mayor, we were told we were building a third station. That was always the discussion. If I'm wrong, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor, just say, Philip, no, this is how it went. Uh, the discussions were third, but in the resolution, and there were members on that strategic priorities and in intergovernmental cooperation, intergovernmental cooperation standing committee that were from the previous council. We were always talking about the third station. So I, I know when, when our current chief came in as, as acting chief, he said, let's put the brakes on. And I said, no, we can't be putting on the brakes now. But if you go back to the timelines, 2006 to 2019, uh, 2017 is where, where, where we should have been, that's the track we should have been on. Whether it was some councillors wanted this or wanted that, though that's the track we should have stayed on. But speaking to our staff here at, 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 at City Hall in the meetings that we had, I, I was always with the impression or with the understanding it was the third station. And you came in as acting chief and said, no, we, we have to revisit and put the pause, uh, press, the, uh, press the pause button on this matter. I, I just really would love to get a resolution because this station next door was opened in 1979. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's showing its age. And I'm not saying to close it, not don't. Don't, I'm not going down there. It's, it's a great station for the downtown and surrounding area, but we do need something uh, to add to or to um, serve a, a purpose that will look at the two zones in a 2023-2023 in a ongoing city of Charlottetown where the growth is happening and where we have the easiest access. I think, Chief, you know yourself, the easiest access to anywhere in the city is on that bypass, their arterial, uh, arterial highway. It can get you from east to west in s minutes compared to going north, south. So again, all the discussions we had since 2018 until last year was all about going forward. I just hope that we can find a resolution in this council of 2022 to 2026 to get something going that will be accommodating and fulfill the, the needs of our professional firefighters and the residents of Charlottetown. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, when we first, when this was thrown on my lap in 2014, <clears throat> the former mayor was here and a few others, and uh, the purpose of the whole station three or, or the third station or whatever it was, was supposed to be a satellite station. Like you just go in, it's gonna be run by volunteers and the whole nine yards and you'll probably have one or two trucks parked there, I don't know. But that was the whole thing, was a satellite station. You can go in any other city or even New York, like they're, I mean, they're parked inside of a garage beside your house, that's how close it is. But the satellites, and then from there on, the problem started was, <coughs> if I can recall, is the designs come in and all of a sudden they got bigger and bigger and bigger and we needed a certain color paint on a certain room and we needed this and we needed that. And it just went right off the charts. So where, did I, where, where fell off the cliff from a satellite station to a full operational station? I don't know where that came from. And then when Chief Mamie came in last year to this committee, which I sat on, uh, and he said, we got to put a pause because there's some things that we just found out at that time that we didn't know about before. So that's the reason it's on a pause, if, if I'm right, Chief Mamie, is because there's more information came to you 
So that's why we put it on a pause. And I'm all in favor of having a fire station out in the north end because, as the mayor says, the population is growing out there. There's no other place to build in the city. That's where they're going. But at the same time, we've got to remember, we don't need a $14 million fire station. We need a satellite station. And that's just my opinion. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Ramsey. Um, if we go back to the... Sorry, sorry, Deputy Mayor. What is that? Really? It's my phone in the back coat. So I just to um, I, just uh, reviewing what Chief Mamie had to say, and I, I think that it sounds like our our biggest struggle yeah. is with 700 to 800 calls per year. If over 500 of them are in the <clears throat> jurisdictional area of Station 1, and we've got about 250 for Station 2, and if we build Station 3 in that location, then Station 2 and Station 3 are going to share the same 250. So it seems like we have a jurisdiction, jurisdictional whatever um, issue. Is that correct, Chief Mamie? Is that our main, besides, besides the new union and the... And, and, that, and that struggle, is that not our, like we're really positioning three stations not correctly within the map of Charlottetown? Uh, Your Worship and uh, Councillor Yankoff, yes, that is correct. Like um, the, a three station concept uh, with those positionings does not improve operations or improve our, uh, our response capabilities. Um, once again, the land purchase for replacement of two changed to three. Uh, all the internal workings didn't don't change like that. Like uh, all of our uh, resources in regards to personnel and apparatus, and response procedures and response areas, which is the main mm -hmm. reason you build a station. You put a station in a location so it can respond to that location. And the main thing you're looking for is that radius or driving distance of five kilometers, eight kilometers. The benefit of putting the station there. If you put it in a place, and I'll give you an example of Station One. Uh, it's downtown. It, it should never move. But 800 meters south, it hits the water. So 4.2 kilometers of coverage gets no credit. We can't respond to it, and it, it, we don't get credit for it. The, people, the insurance rating from our fire underwriter survey gives you a zero for that area. The same sort of issue when you have too much of an overlap. Station one and station two are too close together. Yes, we need something out in the north or the, or the west, but it needs to be done without that too. Why we have the redundancy here when we don't require it in three? So the, the position of the station is all about the area it's gonna to respond to. And if we put ourselves into a corner, when we put a station in the wrong place and don't have our operational procedures in place, all we're doing is compounding the issue. We're spending money that doesn't need spending at the time. And it doesn't mean, believe me, I would like to develop tomorrow as well and change a few things. Uh, very excited to hear that you had a tour of the fire or of the police station. I'd like to see all of you come over to the fire station. I'll send an invite. Uh, we'll, we'll tour station one and station two. You'll see what our needs are. And uh, really, we can go forward from there again. But we do have an operational plan uh, being developed, working on that with our district chiefs and deputy districts about the best way ahead for the, for the city. We also recommend that fire underwriter survey be completed because the last time it was fully completed was 2006, looking at our city. Lots of changes, uh, so just recommend we bring that in. They're the experts, they'll tell us right then. If you had one here and one here, you'd have 95% coverage, that's the best you're gonna get geographically around the, uh, the city. Or if you had one here, which was uh, once a recommendation, and you had that 95% with maybe a satellite station or a small station somewhere. So there's those, uh, those uh, issues there, but we have other things we have to work around it. That response area, those district lines, we have to coordinate all of that. So in hopes with our collective agreement being worked out, we work that out and amend our, as I mentioned, the district response area. So we really have to look at that. But the main reason you put a station somewhere is so it can actually respond to that given area and give you, gives yourselves the coverage for people that live there and the people that work there. If it doesn't do that, if you put it in a corner and you're losing the area for coverage, you're not improving operations. So that's the main reason when it's flipped to a third station. And those issues are not new. Uh, we had tried to raise them. They've been talked about and discussed in different meetings. Uh, I know you have uh, higher level meetings we got there, but 
you know, these issues continue and it's, every fire service has them, of course, it's nothing new, but we're working on that and we'd like to do it uh, responsibly with the taxpayer's money and professionally so that we can actually improve service and put people in the right place. So Chair, just a quick follow-up for um, through you to Chief Mamie. Do we have a new timeline? Uh, Mr. Chair, if maybe um, there's a, there's some matters that uh, on this that uh, particularly with respect to human resources that perhaps would be better discussed in a in a in a closed format, um, and that will probably bring an answer to your question, Madam um, Deputy Mayor. So, Chief Mamie, like for location wise. Like, I guess in your opinion, is there another location that you feel that this satellite office or another station would benefit from for coverage area out in the west uh, north end? Uh, Mr. Chair, as, as, as I think we, we, it may be best because of okay. the human resource implications to have that discussion in the okay. closed session, if you don't okay. mind. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Chair, j just on the agenda, I, I know it's now 1.30, and yeah. uh, I know our two chiefs and their executive assistant want, want to get back to work. <laughs> and Trevor. And um, so could, could I just ask if the committee would be so um, accommodating, could we just leave, postpone that to the next agenda? That is a 6D fire Fiona forward planning presentation. Is that all right? I, I, yep. Deputy, I don't know if you're, it's just, it's 1.30 and I just, again, it's pushing the time limit. Is that are all right, we, sir? Are we moving into closed session for the follow-up on the, okay, sure. Need a motion to move into closed session as per section 1191B, undisclosed confidential information, subsection D, human resources matters, and E, a matter still under consideration of the MGA FPEI. <laughs>